they, what a friendly crowd. Um, for the, the few people in the, in the audience who did not know me, uh, I'm Tobias Gibson, the uh, Dr. John Langton Professor of Legal Studies and Political Science at Westminster. But you're not here to see me, you're here to, to see our distinguished guest, Professor Gerard Magliaca, who is an Indiana University Distinguished Professor and the Samuel R. Rosen Professor at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. Profe Professor Magliaca, the author of five books and dozens of articles, is a highly regarded constitutional scholar. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, and Lawfare. He is among the foremost experts about the third section of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. In fact, he was the first legal scholar to publish a piece arguing that the third section of the 14th Amendment precludes or prevents uh, Donald J. Trump from becoming president again. Um, and according to one legal expert, he has been studying the Constitution, or sorry, the 14th Amendment, third section, since before it was cool. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Gerard Magliaca. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Gibson. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Can you all hear me well in the back? Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time at Westminster, and I'm also going to be speaking tomorrow morning as part of the uh, Churchill events. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be talking there about uh, Churchill's views on our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. And uh, as part of that, I've brought my House of Commons uh, portfolio, which I got in London a long time ago, and I always, it always was odd when I would bring it to conferences, but now finally I've come to one where it actually fits very well with the uh, subject matter I'm going to be discussing. But, okay, but that's tomorrow. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the constitutional challenges to uh, Donald Trump's eligibility that may be made if he wins in November. Um, and you may know that a few weeks ago the Supreme Court decided Trump versus Anderson, which was a case arising from Colorado where the claim was that Donald Trump had violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment on or about January 6, 2021, and that therefore he was barred from serving again as president unless he got a special waiver from Congress. Now, um, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I was an expert witness in the trial in that case, uh, testifying about the history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Okay, so the court in Trump versus Anderson held that the states may not enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against candidates for national office. So presidential candidates, congressional candidates, uh, that they may only enforce Section 3 against candidates for state office, like governor, state attorney general, something like that. Okay, so um, my kind of remarks today are basically going to say why the court's opinion creates several problems that could become rather big uh, if Donald Trump wins. So one, one way to sort of bracket that is to say, well, if, if he doesn't win, then everything I'm about to say, the rest of the talk really doesn't matter. Okay, so we're, we're pretty much going just on the thought of, okay, if he wins in November, then what? And, and how might some of that play out? All right, so by way of sort of background explanation, let me just talk a little bit about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and then kind of what the court's decision in Trump versus Anderson did not say and why the things that it did not say may cause confusion later. So section three, just kind of briefly, and of course we can talk more about some of the details uh, when we do questions and answers. Uh, section three basically was ratified after the Civil War to say that a government official or former government official who had sworn an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection against the Constitution, 
could not return to office unless they received a special waiver from Congress. Um, so this was obviously done to exclude former officials who had joined the Confederacy right, from returning to office after the war unless Congress gave them a special waiver. Um, so the argument then in the uh, Colorado case and in cases that were brought in other states, including Maine, Illinois, and so on, um, was that January 6, 2021 was an insurrection against the Constitution, that Donald Trump had engaged in that insurrection by various actions, including his speech on that day, and that Section 3 applied to him because he was a former government official who had sworn an oath to support the Constitution. And so, adding all that up, you would get to the conclusion that he could not serve again as president unless he got a special waiver from Congress. Okay, so as I mentioned, the court in Trump versus Anderson said that states may not enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against candidates for national office. Now, we can talk, I think that opinion is wrong, but you know, that, that was the unanimous holding. So we're just going to go with that. I mean, if we want, we can talk more later about why I think it's wrong. Um, okay, so here's what the opinion doesn't say or did not address, okay? One, was January 6, 2021 an insurrection against the Constitution of the United States? No comment on that. Two, did Donald Trump engage in insurrection if January 6, 2021 was an insurrection by what he did? No comment on that. Right? Does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment apply to the presidency? or to a former president like Donald Trump, because that was one argument that was made in the case that may, maybe it doesn't. No comment on that, okay? So all that was left out, and instead they went with this sort of narrower, you could either call it a punt, or you could call it just a narrower decision on the ground only that, well, we're not going to say whether he's eligible or not. We're just going to say states cannot enforce this if he isn't eligible. Only Congress can do so. So they said, in another portion of the opinion, only Congress may enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against a candidate for national office. Now, it was kind of vague as to exactly how that might happen, which is one of the problems. But, but that was the basic gist of the court's opinion in Trump v. Anderson. So, why does this create problems? And, and we, I might say parenthetically, you know, in some ways, you can understand why the court might have wanted not to comment on the three things I just mentioned, right? Because they're more controversial. Right? And there's more apt to be disagreement among them about those three things, whereas they could all more or less agree on the question of whether states could enforce Section 3 against national candidates. There are two sets of problems. I'm going to focus more on the second set, but I'll, but I'll describe both of them. The first problem is that there may not be a definitive decision by a court that says Donald Trump can be president, okay? Which means if he wins and then he is inaugurated, right? And then he is president next year at this time, some people are gonna say he's not the lawful president. Uh, now, this will probably come up more in the context of a kind of thing that someone says uh, which has no chance of success in any court, right? So someone doesn't want to pay their taxes and they say, I don't have to pay my taxes because Donald Trump's not the real president. Uh, you're prosecuting me for some drug crime, gun crime, whatever. Well, you can't prosecute me because Donald Trump's not the real president. You know, okay, now none of those are gonna go anywhere, right, in a court. However, uh, th there is a certain either nuisance problem or perhaps a more serious problem of just the fact that that argument is going to sort of exist in the in the atmosphere of American politics 
or American life in a four-year period of a second Trump administration. Okay? Now, the court could have avoided that problem by definitively saying he's eligible. Right? He's eligible because January 6, 2021 was not an insurrection or because even if it was, whatever he did was not engaging in insurrection or it doesn't apply to the presidency or to the president, a uh, former president. Okay, so by not answering those questions, right, they, they've sort of taken a agnostic view on the question of whether Trump is eligible or not, which then will lead some people to fill in the vacuum by saying, in, if he wins, that he's not the real president. Okay. But you might say to yourself, well, all right, yeah, but there's always going to be some people who, who might be conspiracy minded, who might have eccentric legal views of one sort or another. What's a big deal, right? Even if maybe somewhat more people have that view in, in that context than they would for other, you know, objections that you could make up about somebody as to whether they've been lawfully elected or not. Okay, now the second, though, problem that comes out of the Supreme Court's sort of uh, narrow or uh, sort of incomplete decision in Trump versus Anderson is, well, what about the period between Election Day and Inauguration Day, right? What's going to happen then? Uh, will people try then to challenge Donald Trump's eligibility as president-elect to be president, okay? Um, that problem might be especially acute if by then he has also been convicted of something in a criminal case, okay? Now, obviously, we don't know that he's gonna win. We don't know if he's gonna be convicted in a criminal case. We don't even know if a criminal case is even gonna go to trial, right, between now and then, okay? but. You can understand that we would be in an unprecedented circumstance if he were convicted of a felony and then elected, right? I mean, we have had mayors who have been, you know, elected from jail, right, or elected after being convicted. Uh, Mayor Curley of Boston is kind of like probably the most notable example from a long time ago that, you know, comes to mind. But, but okay, not a president elect, right? So it's a little hard to know what people are going to think about that or how they're going to react to that. That's also complicated by the fact that there could be a criminal trial ongoing on election day, right? Given the way the calendar is working uh, with the various criminal proceedings that are underway in all sorts of different places. Okay, now so the court's decision in Trump versus Anderson doesn't say anything about what happens after Election Day. It says states may not enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against candidates for national office. Okay, but what about after the election? Or what about something that Congress does after the election? Now, the most obvious thing that Congress does after the election for president is meet to count the electoral votes on January 6th. So now it's January 6th, 2025. Donald Trump is the president-elect. They have to meet to count the electoral votes. And in a very ironic twist, right, that could be the setting for a challenge to his eligibility based on what happened in the previous January 6th when they counted the electoral votes. Okay, now, how does that process work? Now, ironically, another ironic twist, right, is that, um, okay, after the last January 6th, people decided we need to fix the process because uh, that didn't go well, right? So Congress enacted a reform a bipartisan reform to the way the electoral votes are counted on January 6th. Uh, and what did this reform do? Okay, so first it made clear the vice president doesn't do anything, right? No power whatsoever to do anything 
because that was obviously a, a question that was raised the last January 6th. Second, they made it harder for members of Congress to challenge the electoral votes that the states have sent. So under the old system, you really just needed one member of the House and one senator or two, you know, like not that hard to get. Now you need 20% of each body, okay? That's a bigger threshold, right, to get a challenge going. Okay, if a challenge though is made, right, the way it works is, well, each House of Congress would vote on the electoral votes that they've been given, and if both houses vote to reject the electoral votes of a state or a group of states, then they're not counted, right? And you count the, them for the other candidate, or, I mean, there's other options. Okay, so this means that if you had a scenario where Donald Trump is elected and the Democrats win control of both houses of Congress, there will be a lot of talk about the houses of Congress not certifying his election because he is ineligible. Now, you might say, well, okay, but how likely is it, right, that Donald Trump will win and Democrats will control both houses of Congress? Say, pretty, pretty unlikely, right? Or certainly that's not more probable than not because you'd think either Either he won't win, right, if they're doing well in Congress, or, or if he wins, they won't do so well, right, in controlling Congress. But it's a little more complicated than that, right? So first of all, uh, well, people have pointed out, all right, there are three Republican senators who voted to convict him in the second impeachment trial who are still in the Senate. So even if the Democrats do not control the Senate, pressure will be brought on those three to say, well, if you thought that he was guilty of a high crime and misdemeanor and should not be able to serve again, then you should say that the vote should not be counted and he's ineligible to serve again. So it's not clear that the Democrats must control the Senate in order to get the votes. Second, okay, even if they lack the votes, to disqualify, it's going to be ugly, right? I mean, you can imagine protests, you can imagine counter-protests, you can imagine a lot of pressure being brought on people to vote one way or the other, much has happened on the last January 6th for a different reason, okay? Um, now, when they rewrote the statute talking about how the electoral votes are counted, they, had a, uh, they thought they had an answer to this problem, which was they said, okay, look, if a presidential candidate has a challenge to bring to the electoral votes, you know, they're unhappy about how the votes got counted somewhere or they have some other legal claim, they can go to federal court and bring a case, and that case gets put on like a fast track to the Supreme Court to get it done before the electors vote, okay, and before Congress, you know, meets to count the votes. And that whatever decision the courts make, Congress must accept. That's what the, that's what the statute says, okay? So the whole idea of that was to say, okay, hey, that way Congress doesn't have to decide these kinds of things. The courts will decide and settle it. And Congress is just there to have a ceremony, basically, where they count the votes and, you know, say congratulations to whoever wins, right? Okay, now, here's the difficulty, right, that comes up. Okay, first of all, this law says that only a candidate for president and vice president may bring this kind of lawsuit. Not just any voter, okay? Now, that means somebody's gotta bring the lawsuit in order to 
get the courts to settle it for the joint session of Congress meeting on January 6th. Who's that going to be? Now, one way of thinking of what the law says is only the runner-up can bring the lawsuit. Only in this scenario, President Biden or Vice President Harris can bring the lawsuit because they're the only ones that really have a chance to win if they win the lawsuit, right? But you can understand why President Biden or Vice President Harris may not want to bring such a lawsuit because, after all, wouldn't that be making things worse? They'd be contesting right, the eligibility of the person who won the election, which would only tend to lead to more protests and counter-protests, even if you get a judicial decision that settles it one way or the other. Okay? So they might not be keen on that. So also, it's a little hard to understand how someone can concede and then say, oh yeah, but by the way, I'm bringing a lawsuit to challenge the result. Right? Either you concede or you don't. Okay. Well, what about other candidates? What about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, or anybody else who is running for president or vice president? Can't they bring such a lawsuit? Well, maybe, but it's not clear, right? Because, first of all, this law is new, so nobody's ever interpreted it before or used it before. So, who knows what the answer is to the question of whether any presidential or vice presidential candidate can bring such a lawsuit, or only someone who kind of has a plausible chance of winning the election can bring such a lawsuit. Um, one argument that I've made already in print since Trump versus Anderson was decided was, well, the courts, if they get such a lawsuit from a minor party candidate after the election, should, in the interests of resolving this once and for all, just say, look, any presidential candidate or vice presidential candidate can bring the suit and now we're going to go ahead and decide whether Trump is eligible or not. Now, put, put another way, this is kind of like saying we're going to give the Supreme Court a do-over and, and clean up the confusion or, or you know, omission of their initial opinion. And there is this mechanism to do this, but the mechanism only works if somebody brings the lawsuit and if the courts say that person can bring such a lawsuit. Right? Otherwise, you will get no judicial decision resolving this, and then you will simply get a food fight, or worse, in the joint session of Congress on January 6th. 2025. So this is all by way of saying, first of all, that the court uh, made a mistake in Trump versus Anderson in not speaking more clearly to these questions or in not resolving the case on a substantive ground that would have foreclosed these kinds of problems after the election. It may work out OK in that, first, Trump might not win. Right? So then none of this comes up. Right? Um, but in the event that he does win, then it would be preferable to have the courts weigh in and resolve this right, in a way that Congress must accept because the statute about counting the electoral votes says they must accept whatever the courts say Right? rather than just having no judicial decision at all and then having some sort of melee in Congress. And of course, the degree to which that will be a problem will depend on what the new Congress looks like. Right? The more democratic it is in the event of a Trump victory, the more likely there is going to be a problem on certification day. So this is kind of where things stand. And you know, I will kind of uh, just, just add parenthetically you know, that, uh, of course, 
There are advantages to having a unanimous Supreme Court decision and a narrow Supreme Court decision sometimes, right, where they're not going out of their way to address controversial things. Um, and, you know, you can see, as I said earlier, why they wouldn't want to say some of these, these or comment on some of these things and why courts, even after the election, might be reluctant to comment on some of these things. I mean, first of all, okay, after the election, elections happened, right? People have already voted. So then it's much harder to say at that point, oh, well, by the way, the person who won isn't really eligible to hold the office at all. Right? I mean, if you're going to make that decision, it's easier to do it beforehand when there's time to put up another nominee and do other things. Um, another difficulty is that um, to say that January 6th was not an insurrection or to say that what Trump did did not constitute engaging in insurrection, it's not easy to write that decision without sounding like you're condoning what happened. Right? And I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't want to say anything about it, because even if they, they think that those things do not qualify as insurrection, it's hard to write it without it sounding like you're saying you thought it was okay. And so they might not have just wanted to do that, and that'll be true also for a judicial decision or a judge asked to make that kind of determination after the election. Uh, now, you can also understand, though, the reluctance to say the opposite. Okay, now, for example, if you have a judicial ruling, or even by one judge, let's say, say it's one Supreme Court justice, okay, who were to say, um, well, I don't think Donald Trump is eligible to be president, right? Well, what does that mean exactly if he, in fact, becomes a president? Right, that then for four years you just say everything he's done is unlawful uh, and has no doesn't count for anything, or you say, well, okay, I, I think he's ineligible, but okay, I lost, so now everything that he did, he actually is the lawful occupant of that office. I mean, you can understand why, again, you might be hesitant to say that. The thing is that, again, a lot of this is, one, sort of based on a sort of uh, uh, either a, you know, we might call it a procrastinating hope that uh, Trump does not in fact win and thus these problems never arise, right? And second, they, they exist in, or are determined in a circumstance where we don't know what the outcome of the criminal cases would be, right? Because if you take that out of the equation and you, you didn't have that involved, then you might say, well, okay, basically people would vote in November and whatever happens, happens. and. Yeah, there's this argument about what the third section of the 14th Amendment means, but you know, people kind of were aware of that and they voted and that's, that's it, okay? It's just that there's this added sort of wild card, in fact, of trying to figure out what you think the criminal cases mean for how people are gonna think about that. Because of course, ordinarily, right, if I said, well, someone's been convicted of a felony and they've been elected president, the answer is, well, they're eligible to be president. I mean, the Constitution doesn't say anything about being ineligible or unable to serve because you've been convicted of a felony, right? But here there is this constitutional argument that has gone unaddressed, which it can serve as a kind of a bootstrap, in effect, for people who want to say, look, I, I don't think that he should be able to be president because he's been convicted of a felony. So, you know, in a... So in an essay I wrote after Trump versus Anderson, I, I decided to, I've been saving this quote for years, waiting for the right time to use it. And I finally decided this is the time to use it. And it's from Lord of the Rings. OK? So because the figure, OK, how often do you get to quote Lord of the Rings? So Treebeard, right? The Ent. Right? So he's talking to the hobbits. And they say something about the fact that, you know, Gandalf's worried about to what, whatever, right? And, he, and Treebeard says, wizards are always troubled about the future. You know, so maybe I'm just a wizard. You know, it's like, okay, why are you looking for problems that may not happen? Or, you know, they'll all work out okay, right? But in some ways, hey, uh, that's part of my job as a, as a law professor of obscure topics. Right? So, so hopefully, there's really nothing to worry about. But we should probably worry a little bit about it. 
So, so with, with that, that, I will stop. We do have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions, so if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Do you believe that the question of whether, whether or not January 6th was, was or wasn't an insurrection will ever be answered? I don't know. Um, not necessarily because if you did have a case brought, of course, the case could be resolved on one of the other grounds that I mentioned, right, which then you wouldn't have to discuss whether January 6th was an insurrection or not. Um, you know, I, I don't know because I'm not sure, first of all, whether my advice will be taken <laughs> right? So if you never have a judicial case brought, or if it's thrown out on some ground like somebody who's bringing it is not the person who can bring it, then there will be no judicial determination of that. There will only be, you know, like the people like to say something like, the court of history uh, will decide, right, uh, long after we're all dead, right? And then so that, that's not quite as, as, as good uh, a resolution uh, for, for the living. Um, I don't know is the short answer to your, to your question. I, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about the perspective that the Supreme Court took like, in this argument. I know they, it's like they seem to skip steps in terms of like coming to the ruling, but do you think that their primary concern like as justices was like, we don't want states all doing their own thing for one ballot in November? So I understand that it's a national candidate, but with states like choosing whether or not he is or isn't eligible is, I feel like, Oh, yeah, restate the question, sir, for the uh, online audience. Okay, so the question being like, okay, well, wasn't the court rightly concerned at the fact that states, if they were able to make their own determinations, would then have inconsistent determinations, or there would be a sort of, um, we'll call it chaotic kind of election process? I mean, am I fairly restating your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so a couple of things to say about that, right? So, so one is... Uh, yes, but only if you, they could have solved that problem by simply ruling that Trump was ineligible to be president, right? Then there wouldn't be any inconsistency or uh, freedom for states to reach different conclusions. There'd just be one conclusion, right? Or they could have done the opposite. They could have said he is eligible to be president. So, you know, there again, no need for states to reach different conclusions. So you could avoid that problem by reaching a determination one way or another on the merits. Yeah. But is that not premature because he hasn't been convicted in court law? So at some point it will come before the Supreme Court again. Whether it's Right. So the, the question was, you know, basically, well, since he's not been convicted of anything, isn't it premature to rule on his eligibility or ineligibility? So the two things to say about that. One is Section 3 doesn't require a criminal conviction. Um, all of the former Confederates who were disqualified after the war, none of them had been convicted of a crime. Um, secondly, it's more difficult much more difficult to address that issue once someone is the president, right? So in other words, in practice, it's not clear that you can, in fact, judicially remove a sitting president, even if they are unqualified to be president, right? So one argument there would be, well, you have to impeach them. I mean, that's the only way you can remove them. Um, so it, it's like it's premature, and then it's too late. Right? So you, you kind of got to pick one, one or the other. Um, now, that said, I mean, I, I certainly can see why some of the justices might have thought that in the absence of a criminal conviction or in the absence of any other determination other than the one made by the Colorado trial court that Trump was 
engage in insurrection on January 6, 2021, that they, they didn't want to, you know, reach that question, right? Now, and again, that may work out fine if he doesn't win, because then it's like, well, they didn't have to rule on any of that, and, it, it, you know, nothing really bad happened as a result. It's just that, well, it's a risk. It's, and we'll see, you know, whether it's a, the risk was worth taking or not. Hmm? Okay, so the question is kind of how does the historical context of Section 3 inform what we uh, should think about January 6, 2021? Uh, okay, so, so one thing you could say about that is, well, they did consider the thought that we should just let the people decide, and they rejected that. They said that in, in some instances, some you know, narrow circumstances, that people were not eligible to serve even if voters wanted them. Okay, and that was made uh, clear many times by people who said, look, Jefferson Davis cannot become president no matter what, I mean, unless Congress gives him a waiver. Uh, that he has betrayed his, betrayed his trust to the Constitution, and it would be dangerous to allow someone like that back into office. Now, that doesn't answer the question of whether you think January 6th is an insurrection or not. Um, I mean, I testified about that in the, in the trial court to sort of explain what did people at the time think an insurrection was, and what did they think engaging in an insurrection meant. Okay, and from that I rendered an opinion that, that it was an insurrection, okay, and that the standard was pretty broad for what, you know, would count as engaging in one. But um, I, I think the broader historical context that I take away goes something like this. Um, well, look, after the Civil War, there were a number of Supreme Court cases about how the 14th Amendment should apply to things like racial discrimination. And the court took the view that, well, um, you know, it's going to be too hard, too unpopular to enforce it as written. Let's not do that. That didn't work out well. Okay? There's a warning there. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that the same will happen now, right? I mean, things don't just automatically repeat themselves. Okay, it's just something to be kind of mindful of and to ask, well, is that a similar problem now if you say, well, gee, it would be awfully disruptive to apply the provision as written. Um, and, well, yeah, maybe, but maybe the alternative is worse. We don't know, right? And, you know, in some sense, the first time around, they had no precedent for that at all. So they were kind of guessing, right, or more at sea. Now we have their precedent to look at. So, no, we can draw whatever lessons you want from it, but I mean, it's a little more, there's a little more information to go on than they would have had then. Hmm? Right, so the question is, okay, what implications would this have for, say, other candidates or other allegations that someone has engaged in an insurrection and therefore cannot serve in office, right, if that's, okay. Um, well, look, we went 150 years without anybody using Section 3 of the 14th Amendment for an insurrectionist. 
So, you know, I don't know that the fact that the claim has arisen in a few cases since January 6, 2021 means that now it's just like a free for all for using that provision. Uh, in some ways, you might say that the court's decision sort of pushes you in the opposite direction by narrowing, you know, what can be done. Um, look, you know, one answer to that is kind of like that's why you have courts, you know, to sort of evaluate claims. I can, I can sue any of you <laughs> tomorrow, right, making some crazy allegations. Well, okay, but the answer to that is not don't let me sue people. The answer is, well, we have a process for evaluating lawsuits, and we also have a process for dealing with frivolous claims, by the way, which includes sanctions and fines and other things that happen to people who bring frivolous lawsuits. So, you know, that's always a risk whenever you want to enforce anything. It could be abused. But we have a process in place to try to curtail or eliminate abuses. Yes. Do you believe the decision that came about from Trump versus Anderson, do you believe the court was trying to be intentionally vague, or was it more of a product of uh, the interpretation of what is in the Constitution? Well, okay, I think there are a couple of possibilities. One is they, they hurried the thing out. They decided that they had to get it out before Super Tuesday because that was the day of the Colorado primary, which the case was about. Now, when you read it, you can tell it was rushed. How can you tell? Well, first, normally opinions have some sort of, you know, summary that is prepared by the court reporter. Doesn't have that. Normally, they clean up all the metadata in the PDF before they put it out. They didn't do that, so now then people went and looked and was like, oh, gee, it turned out this, this opinion was a dissent, started out as a dissent, and then it became a concurrence. And, you know. and if you look, read it carefully, you can see some things don't match up. In other words, it would be like, I say something in response to something you didn't say. So it's like, well, why is that? Well, the answer probably is, well, maybe you did say it, and then you took it out, but then I didn't have time to take out or change the part where I was responding to you. Right? So it was all hurried out there, I think wrongfully, because, I mean, I think if they'd taken two more weeks, nobody would have cared, and it would have been fine. But, you know, that's, okay. But maybe one of them thought they had to get it out by Super Tuesday. Um, okay, so that then, of course, if you have a very compressed time frame, it's like, well, hey, uh, we don't have time to go into detail on all these complicated matters, right? So that's part of it. I think the other part of it is they could, you know, in good faith, think that the less we say, the better. You know? And that's especially true, by the way, because, well, there are these criminal cases pending. So you can imagine if they had commented on what Trump did, right, that would have been relevant. People would have quoted it in the criminal cases, at least the criminal case about January 6th. I mean, some of the criminal cases have nothing to do with that. But um, So they might have been worried that, well, then aren't we kind of influencing the criminal case in some way, right? So I think it's partly a product of the time frame. It's partly the product of these other things that are going on. And it's also partly the product of that it's in an election year. And, the, and it's about the campaign, and the campaign is ongoing, right? And, you know, I mean, look, I went to the oral argument. I attended it in person. I had not attended an oral argument for a very long time. And you could tell by the body language of them within the first 10 minutes. They were just like, how do we get it? How do we avoid, like, we don't want to touch this with a 10-foot ball. You know, like, just, just tell us how we're going to get rid of this. And, you know, like, and because you, you just see it, it, they're just very uncomfortable basically, with, the, and any, with anything that was seen to be talking about Trump directly, right? And, okay, the opinion kind of demonstrates that. Now, look, whether that's the right thing to do or not, that's another question. But it's understandable. Yeah, time for one more question. Uh, presuming the... the Uh, 
Well, okay, so the question is, you know, if, if there's a challenge after the election, you know, how much does a criminal conviction matter? So, of course, one question would be, which criminal case is the one that's going to actually go to trial? Now, if it's this case in New York that has to do with things that are unrelated to January 6th, not, not much, right? Um, if it's the actual case the special counsel has brought about January 6th, it matters somewhat, okay, even though it's not necessary to a finding of disqualification, it probably strengthens the case for disqualification. Uh, that said, you know, look, I, I guess people are going to say, well, as long as it, the conviction happened before the election, such that voters were informed and voted, and then they voted for him anyway, People are going to say, well, okay, you know, people, now, where that gets a bit messy is, well, what if the conviction happens in the third week of October or something, and, well, uh, hey, I already voted, you know, because my state had early voting or something, right? I mean, th this is why, again, sort of the, is it premature? Well, may maybe the answer is at some point it starts to become, you know, too late, or the lateness starts to make things more complicated or conviction happens between election day and the day the electors meet? No, I don't know, right? I mean, we have one precedent, incidentally, how much time do we have? Okay, we have one precedent, incidentally, you know, where a Horace Greeley, who ran for president in 1872 and lost, right, he died a couple of weeks after election day. So then the, his electors were kind of like, uh, what do we do? You know, he's dead, right? So some of them voted for him anyway, because, it is, well, I was pledged to vote for him. I mean, I have to vote for him. Others said, no, no, we'll vote for his running mate or we'll vote for other people, okay? So there is at least one example of, well, something could happen between election day and elector day, right, that then complicates what you do if you're an elector. But different scenario if you say, well, someone's been convicted of a felony and they say, yeah, but well, okay, that's, uh, that's not disqualifying, right, in a constitutional sense. It may just be disqualifying in some bigger sense. Okay, well, thanks very much. <laughs>